The aim of this talk is to explain some of the intuition behind what differential privacy is and how it can protect your confidentiality. So most people don't realize um, the impact that differential privacy has on their day-to-day -day experience. So we're gonna start with some examples of real deployments of differential privacy. So first there's the US Census Bureau whose goal is to collect information about businesses and people in the US. This data can only be used for statistical purposes which means that the information being published cannot be used to re-identify specific individuals. Over the years, um, this has become a challenging task for many reasons. First, it's become so easy to collect observational data about millions of people. So there are many data sets available for free or from commercial sources. A concern is that someone may be able to link these data sets to census data to obtain additional information about target individuals that they didn't have before. So linking attacks can be successful even if the census only publishes data in aggregated form. For example, in the past, the decennial census published billions of statistics about millions of people. So as Danny said, that's a simple linear algebra to reconstruct some information. So reconstructing information um, from all, reconstructing records from all this information is fairly easy now. We have fancy data science reconstruction algorithms. We have software for solving optimization um, problems at scale. And we also have cheap cloud computing, which makes all this possible. So in the face of such attacks, confidentiality needs to be protected for multiple reasons. First, it's ethical. And second, you need people to trust the Census Bureau so that they provide truthful responses. Um, another reason is Title 13 outlines penalties such as up to five years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000 for disclosing private information. In some cases, such as when the census data is mixed with IRS data, the penalty increases to up to 22 years in prison. And just for reference, a first degree felony in Pennsylvania carries a shorter maximum sentence. So differential privacy has been in the census toolkit for a while now. In 2008, uh, the on the map tool contained the very first large scale a public deployment of differential privacy. And as you probably heard, it's gonna be used in the 2020 census. So the use of differential privacy at the Census Bureau follows something that is called the central model of privacy. And in this model, the data collector is trusted by the respondents. The alternative is the local model in which the data collector is not trusted. So here's an example. So Google is very interested in information about you. This includes your online behavior and your usage of their technology. One of their earlier goals was to understand what um, were common user settings for the Chrome browser. So these settings included home pages and plugins that you had installed. So just sending all of this information to Google would be just a massive breach of privacy. You need user consent to do this and very few users actually choose to opt in to data collection campaigns. So in 2014, Google added a differentially private component called Rapport to the Chrome browser. Rapport takes your browser settings, converts them to bits, randomizes those bits, and then sends those noisy bits back to Google. This noise protects your information so Google doesn't know what your true settings are. Anyone who hacks their servers won't know what your true settings are. And so this information is technologically protected also from warrants and subpoenas. Um, so when Google aggregates these noisy bits from millions of users, they can actually figure out population statistics, such as the most popular plugins. So again, this is called the local model. The user doesn't trust the data collector. The user's information is safe from the data collector but the data collector can still learn about properties of the population. So one can argue that differential privacy became mainstream when Apple started using it. So Apple wanted to understand your mobile device usage in quite detail. Uh, they wanted to know, for example, what websites people visit uh, through apps so that they can recommend links. They want to know what words people type so that they can make better predictive keyboards. And of course, most importantly, they want to know about emoji usage so that they can recommend emojis. Now, the problem is that software that collects your keystroke and sends them to a third party is a type of malware called a keylogger, right? unless you use differential privacy. So keystrokes um, and usage information, again, can be converted to bits. The bits can be randomized so that Apple does not know what you did. Uh, however, once Apple gets, collects all of these bits from millions of users and aggregates them across the user base, they can start to see trends. So again, this is the local model. 
And it didn't stop there. Uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Samsung, Uber, and many other companies have now invested in differential privacy. So the takeaway message is that differential privacy has an important selling point. It enables the study of data that you would not be able to access otherwise, even if you're a tech giant. So as we saw from these examples, uh, there are two trust models, and both of them will be explored in this talk. The central model has a trusted data collector who gets to see the real data, and all the perturbations happen after the data has been collected. Uh, in contrast, in the local model, the users do not trust the data collector. So the data are perturbed before being sent to the data collector. This gives you more privacy, but as we'll see, this comes at a cost of lower accuracy. So in both of these models, differential privacy offers another benefit. Everyone is allowed to know exactly how the data were perturbed. So this is tremendously useful for data analysis, and it does not increase privacy risk at all. So as a result, you can actually release the source code. Uh, sorry, you should release the source code. Okay, so there are many examples of source code implementations uh, of differential privacy algorithms. So it includes the disclosure avoidance code from the census end-to-end -end test, uh, includes the code that Google uses to analyze browser settings. Um, I think Danny mentioned OpenDP, which is an open differential, open differential privacy library that m implements many of the algorithms in the literature, and, and there are many, many more. Okay, so now let's try to build up some intuition about what differential privacy is and how it actually protects privacy. So algorithms for differential privacy are called mechanisms. So if I use the word mechanism, just think of it as an algorithm that you run on your code to produce privacy preserving outputs. Uh, so even though differential privacy was officially invented in 2006, mechanisms for differential privacy existed much, much earlier. So let's go back in time to uh, just before 1965. So in those days, um, meetings were held face-to-face -face instead of through Zoom. There were also in-person face-to-face surveys. Uh, the problem with these surveys is that some of the questions uh, just kind of ruin the mood. For example, suppose you're researching insider trading. You ask the interviewee if they ever did it, and they become more likely to lie to you or just throw you out of their house. So in 1965, Warner invented randomized response. So this is a technique that relies on a spinner. So only the respondent sees the spinner. It has a true region that occupies a proportion P of the area and a false region that occupies a proportion one minus P. Here P is some number strictly between one half and one. So the way this works is if the spinner lands on true, the respondent answers truthfully. And if the spinner lands on false, the respondent is supposed to lie. The interviewer does not see the spinner and does not know if the respondent lied or not, but the interviewer does know the probability of a lie, which is one minus P. For a respondent using this mechanism, we'll see that their privacy guarantees are the following. So with randomized response, their private information is protected almost as well as the case where they just lie whenever it suits them. So the protection they receive only depends on the randomness in the spinner. It does not depend on any prior beliefs um, that the attacker or interviewer or anyone else might have about the data. The spinner is completely public. The only thing that the respondent needs to keep hidden is the randomness in it, which is uh, basically the outcome of the spin. Okay, so let's analyze the privacy guarantees in more detail. So before Warner, um, this is what happens. Suppose the respondent um, has engaged in insider trading. The respondent has two choices. The first choice is to answer truthfully. We call this the factual world. The second choice is to always deny insider trading, which is what we call the privacy preserving counterfactual world because their response does not incriminate them in this case. So if we don't trust the interviewer, we have a strong incentive to avoid being factual. Okay, now let's see what happens with Warner Spinner. So again, a respondent is guilty of insider trading. We can view the spinner now as a machine. Okay, so the respondent feeds their response into the machine, and with probability P, um, the machine outputs the response unchanged, and with probability one minus P, it flips the response. Okay, so now, in the factual world, where the respondent inputs yes, the output is yes with probability P, and no with probability one minus P. And now let's consider the privacy-preserving counterfactual world where the input, where the respondent inputs no. Now the output is yes with probability one minus P instead of P, and the output is no with probability P. 
So the question is, um, now that we have this machine in between the respondent and the interviewer, is there still an incentive to lie? And let's take a closer look. So first we summarize what we know. Um, if the respondent feeds in yes into the spinner, the output is yes with probability p. If the respondent feeds no into the spinner, the output is yes with probability one minus p. So we see that the, um, if the respondent decides to be factual instead of lying, the probability of a yes goes from one minus p to p, which is a change by a factor of p over one minus p. Similarly, the probability of a no changes by a factor of one minus p over p. So as p gets closer to half, these factors uh, get closer to half, meaning that the probabilities are almost unchanged no matter what the input is, so no matter what the respondent said. So hence, um, p close to one half gives more privacy and p far from one half gives less privacy. So we can summarize uh, what we've learned with one equation, which is this one right here. Um, so for any possible output, whether it's yes or no, we can examine the probability of seeing this output E if we feed in a true response into the mechanism and we can compare it to the probability of seeing E if we lied to the mechanism. And we see that the probability of any output changes up or down by at most a factor of P over one minus P. Okay, so we're gonna take the natural log of this quantity, so natural log of P over one minus P, and we're gonna call it epsilon. And okay, spoiler alert, um, this is the epsilon in differential privacy, and this is uh, one way that you can use to interpret what it means. Okay, um, so let's see how this, um, how this equation here translates into meaningful privacy guarantees. So um, let's give Bob, let's give the respondent a name, call him Bob, okay, to make it a little bit less impersonal. Um, we'll actually introduce a new character now, which is the data snooper. Um, sometimes in the literature it's called an attacker or an adversary. So the data snooper sees the output of the randomized response. And instead of using it for statistical purposes, like he should, uh, the snooper wants to infer specific information about Bob's response. So a Bayesian snooper would have a prior probability that Bob is an insider trader, uh, is an insider trader, and could compute these prior odds. The probability, prior probability of response equals yes um, over prior probability of response equals no. And so if Bob is honest with the randomized response mechanism, how would the snooper's belief change? So let's suppose that the output of the randomized response was yes, okay? So the snooper can use this information to get a posterior distribution and compute the posterior odds over here, which are the updated probability that Bob is an insider trader divided by the, prob the updated probability that he is not. So how do the prior odds over here compare to the posterior odds? So randomized response guarantees that they increase or decrease by a factor of P over one minus P. And if we remember that, log that epsilon is log of this quantity, it means that the um, change is by at most e to the epsilon or e to the minus epsilon. Okay, so what if randomized response produced the output no instead of yes? So we're gonna get the same guarantee. You work through the math and basically the change from prior odds to posterior odds is again bounded between e to the minus epsilon and e to the epsilon. Okay, so to summarize, no matter what happens, the odds change by at most a factor e to the epsilon. So no matter what happens and no matter what the respondent does, um, that's the bound on the odds. Okay, so um, we discussed this in the context of randomized response, um, but the same guarantees actually hold for any differentially private algorithm in the local model, which is a setting where you don't trust uh, the data collector. So since e to the epsilon refers to the change in odds, um, I just put in some typical values uh, that people use. So setting epsilon equals to one allows a change by a factor up to 2.72. Setting epsilon to 0 0.5 allows a change by up to 1.65. And setting epsilon to 0 0.1 allows a change by a factor of around 1.11. Okay, so that's the Bayesian, Bayesian interpretation. So let's uh, go on to the frequentist interpretation. Um, so for concreteness, let's suppose that the spinner probability P is 0 0.55. So they tell the truth with probability 0 0.55. So our magical quantity P over one minus P becomes 1.22 and the epsilon, the natural log of that is about 0 0.2. So our frequentist snooper may have decided that the null hypothesis is that Bob did not engage in insider trading. So the alternative hypothesis would be that Bob is guilty. 
Um, under the null hypothesis, the probability of observing output yes is 0.45, and probability of observing the output no is 0.55. So no matter what happens um, with the survey response, with the spinner, the snooper does not gain enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis at reasonable levels. Uh, but you might ask, well, what if the snooper has other evidence about Bob and wants to create a hypothesis testing procedure that combines it with the output of randomized response? So the additional fact of randomized response when combined with the prior knowledge, with the prior evidence, um, so the change is a little bit harder to describe, but basically the ratio of the power to the type 1 error will change by at most d to the epsilon. So another way to think of it is that if we keep the type 1 error fixed, the power can increase by at most d to the epsilon. And although, again, we discussed it in the context of randomized response, the same holds for any differentially private algorithm in the local model. Okay. Um, so there are other interpretations uh, that are possible that you can use without getting too technical. So if you want to explain to someone without using a lot of math, you can give a, hypo a scenario like this. So suppose Bob is participating in an insider trading survey with 100 other people. So I um, suppose Bob is the only one who actually traded stocks uh, based on non-public information. So Bob is the outlier in this data set, but you can convince him that he would still be protected as follows. So suppose the randomized response probability again is 0.55. If Bob answers truthfully, there's an almost even chance that his response will be changed to a no anyway, right? 0.45, close enough. If Bob's response doesn't get randomly changed, uh, so the mechanism outputs yes for him, there's still going to be around 45 other people whose response was changed to yes. So Bob is now effectively hiding in a crowd of around 45 other people. And even if the interviewer knew that one person in the survey was guilty, the interviewer won't know which one it was because there are two layers of uncertainty, whether or not the guilty person's response was changed. And if it wasn't changed, then which among these 45 people with yes outputs is the guilty one? So in this interpretation, we used uncertainty about the data, which is that one person was guilty, combined with the additional randomness uh, in randomized response. But in the previous interpretations, we didn't. For example, in the Bayesian interpretation, uh, the bounds that change in, um, the Bayesian interpretation that changes, that bounds the change in the odds worked for any prior the attacker might have. So it only depended on the randomization in the spinner. So you can strengthen the uh, randomized response guarantees by considering uh, attacker priors, but you don't need to because the randomness in the spinner is strong enough by itself to protect you. Okay, so we spent a lot of time discussing uh, the privacy of randomized response and actually by extension of differential privacy in the local model. So let, let's see what information we can gain by applying this technique, right? So suppose there's this newly introduced Senate bill and it's uh, a bit controversial. Uh, but despite that, we still want to know how many senators privately approve of this bill. So not their public statements, but their private uh, beliefs about it. Okay, so if you walk into each senator's office um, and ask them directly, you might see some response bias. So the answer you get might be different from their true beliefs because they may be worried about re-election or they ha may have made prior deals related to other bills or there might be other reasons. So instead of being direct, you could bring a copy of Warner Spinner with you to each senator's office. So now as they listen with rapt attention to your explanation of the mathematics of uh, randomized response privacy guarantees, two things are gonna become clear. First, um, there's no longer an incentive to lie. So the information leakage is actually small. So maybe now there's even a small incentive uh, to submit a, well, so if they have a, an incentive to lie, it's very small. Um, but on the other hand, they might be interested in the result, right? What did their colleagues privately believe? And so that's actually an incentive to submit a true input to randomized response. So overall, um, due to the possibility of gaining uh, information, there can be an, an incentive to truthfully participate in the protocol. Okay, so we're going to repeat this with all of the senators and get a randomized response report from each of them. So now we're interested in pi s, which is the proportion of senators who privately support this bill. So we don't know pi s. All we know is the number of senators for which the output of randomized response was yes. And we could call that number y. And from y, we have to estimate pi s. 
So there's a wrong way to do that. The wrong way is to divide y, the number of yes responses from randomized response, by the number of senators. Um, this should be obvious, but just in case, um, if the randomized response parameter is 0 0.6 and no senators supported the bill, we would still see around 40 reports equal to yes because of randomness in the spinner. So we can't just ignore the perturbations applied to the data. Uh, and this is an important point, actually, when you're working with differential privacy or any other disclosure avoidance technique. So the nice thing about randomized response and differential privacy is that you know exactly how the data are randomized so that you can adjust your inference. In the case of randomized response, we can use this formula over here to get an unbiased estimate of the proportion of senators who privately support this bill. And the standard deviation of your estimate would be this um, slightly long formula. So if we plug in our numbers from our numerical example, we, um, where the privacy parameter was 0 0.6, we see that the standard deviation we get here is around 0 0.25 for the proportion of senators supporting the bill. Since we're estimating a proportion, um, basically a number between 0 and 1, a standard deviation of 0 0.25 is unacceptably large, right? So this seems uh, disappointing. We went through all of this trouble to protect the privacy of the senators, and at the end we got a fairly useless result. So there are several things we can do, right? The first thing is uh, we can try to increase the sample size. So we know that there are 100 senators, but there are many more uh, representatives. So there are 435 of them. So maybe we can improve the accuracy by targeting a larger population. So now we can go to the office of each representative. They listen again to our explanation of randomized response, probably with even more fascination than the senators. Okay, so we're trying to estimate the proportion of representatives who privately think the bill is a good idea. So this will be pi r. And after applying randomized response, we get again y outputs that equal yes. We can apply, we can get an unbiased estimate of the proportion of representatives supporting the bill using this formula. It has this standard deviation. And when we plug in our numbers, the population size and the privacy parameter, we get a standard deviation of around 0.117. So it's not great, but it's much better than our exercise with the Senate. And overall, what we would see as we increase our population is that the standard deviation of our estimate decreases at a rate proportional to one over square root population size. So again, we're gonna ask the question, can we do better? And for example, can we keep the same nice privacy guarantee, but improve on accuracy? And now the answer is yes, but we need a trusted data collector. So previously, we were in the local model where the respondents did not trust the data collector. So let's consider what happens when the data collector is actually trusted. So the senators welcome us back and tell us truthfully what they think. We tally up the yes responses, and we need to figure out a way to publicize the result. So first, we note that we can't just reveal the exact tally. And the reason is, well, let's say that in a sudden outbreak of bipartisanship, 99 senators decide to collude and use the exact tally to figure out what was the response of the 100th senator. Right? So that 100th senator would be in trouble if we, told, if we revealed the exact tally. So we have to perturb it somehow. And um, since the senators were so excited about randomized response, we should perturb it in such a way that each senator gets the same privacy protections as they would have with randomized response. Right? So the trick is we need to provide the same privacy, but better accuracy. So just as a reminder of the randomized response guarantees, if one person changes their input, the output probability of any event increased or decreased by a factor of at most p over one minus p, which is the same as e to the epsilon. So the insight um, in the paper that introduced differential privacy is that the data collector can actually, instead of perturbing each record individually, you can add Laplace noise with scale one over epsilon to the number of yes responses. So this process is called the Laplace mechanism. So the Laplace distribution, if you're not very familiar with it, has uh, with scale one over epsilon, it has the following density function over here, and its variance is two over epsilon squared. So it gives the same privacy guarantee as randomized response, but more accuracy. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So we have 99 colluding senators uh, trying to determine how the 100th senator responded to the trusted data collector. So these 99 senators get together and determine that X of them responded yes and 99 minus X responded no. 
So regarding Senator 100, there are two possibilities. Case one, um, the Senator voted yes, in which case the trusted data collector would see X plus one yes votes and adds Laplace noise uh, to, the, to it. And then you get the following density function with the peak at X plus one. In case two, um, the senator votes no, and the data collector sees X instead of X plus one yes votes and adds Laplace noise with scale one over epsilon to it. And here we have um, the output distribution with the peak at X instead of X plus one. Okay, so the 99 colluding senators are going to observe a noisy count. They know it either came from the top distribution or from the bottom distribution, and their job is to figure out which one it was. So. Let's plot the densities together. On the left is this plot, where we just use the same plot instead of two different plots. And on the right, it's the same as the left, except I changed it to be log scale on the y-axis. So when we plot in the log scale, the ratio of the densities is equivalent to a visual vertical distance between them. So this log scale plot shows that the ratio of the densities is always bounded. And it's between e to the minus epsilon and e to the epsilon. So what does this mean? That means if Senator 100 had submitted a no response instead of a yes response or vice versa, the only effect this would have is that the probability density would increase or decrease by a factor of at most e to the epsilon. Okay, so from this it follows that the probability of any output event would increase or decrease by a factor of at most e to the epsilon. Um, so the probability of seeing some event e if Senator responded yes would be at most e to the epsilon times the probability of that event had the um, senator responded no, and, and vice versa. So these are the same equations that are, which, which uh, gave us the randomized response privacy guarantees. So they guarantee that any data snooper, even with the help of the other 99 senators, would have low confidence in trying to figure out what, whether Senator 100 voted yes or no. And this um, guarantee is not specific to Senator 100. Any senator gets this guarantee. So the confidentiality of their response is protected even if all of the other senators collude and use the latest data science inference techniques or um, somehow they travel into the future and get some future data science techniques. None of this will help the snooper. So differential privacy is future proof. Okay, so we got the same privacy guarantees, but let's examine accuracy. So when we use randomized response with P equals 0 0.6, that corresponds to an epsilon of 0. 405. When we tried to estimate the proportion of senators who pri privately supported the bill by using randomized response, we got a standard deviation of about 0 0.25. Um, if we have a trusted data collector who uses the Laplace mechanism, the standard deviation then decreases to 0 0.035. And if we try the same exercise in the House of Representatives, which has a larger population, we see that the estimate under randomized response has standard deviation 0 0.117, but under the Laplace mechanism, it's 0 0.008. Okay, so if we worked out the math uh, and not just relied on some, a few numerical examples, we'd see that under randomized response, standard deviation due to privacy is proportional to one over square root population size. On the other hand, under the Laplace mechanism, the standard deviation is proportional to one over n. Right, okay. And aside from accuracy, uh, an underappreciated selling point is that in both of these cases, we had full transparency. So full details about the Laplace mechanism and randomized response could be made public. And none of this degrades the privacy guarantees, but it does help the data analysts. So they can take the output of randomized response or the Laplace mechanism. They can use it to estimate properties of the population, such as how many members of Congress supported a particular issue. And the transparency allows us to create estimates uh, compute standard deviations, confidence intervals, and so on, which we wouldn't be able to do if the mechanisms were hidden. Okay, so um, now let's examine differential privacy itself more systematically. So differential privacy is built on the concept of neighboring databases. So for now, we'll say that two databases are neighbors if you can obtain D2 by changing exactly one record in D1. So you can think of this as the difference between D1 and D2 is the response of a single individual. And that's where the differential part of differential privacy comes from. So note that if we change the response of one person, then N, which is the number of people in the, number of people in the data set, it stays the same. Okay, we're gonna revisit this point a little bit later. 
Okay, so remember, a mechanism is something that we feed data into. It performs some data perturbations and produces an output. So we say that a mechanism satisfies, well, if a mechanism satisfies differential privacy, then we get all of these good privacy properties that we talked about with randomized response. So the epsilon that we've been talking about all this time has a fancy name. It's uh, called the privacy loss budget, and we'll see why that is later. Uh, but to check if a mechanism satisfies epsilon differential privacy, what we need to do is we need to consider all possible pairs of databases that are neighbors to each other. We also have to consider all possible sets E, and then we have to check that these, essentially the randomized response equations, hold for all of those choices. So these equations say that if we run our mechanism on database D1 instead of D2, all it does is change the output probabilities by a factor of at most E to the epsilon. So if one person changes their response, all it does is change the output probabilities by a little bit. So there are a few key points to bear in mind. We have to look at all possible pairs of databases, all possible pairs that are neighbors of each other. We don't just look at neighbors of the actual database that we have assembled. Uh, the second point is that the mechanisms must employ randomness. We saw that it was true for randomized response. We saw it was true for the Laplace mechanism. We also saw that we cannot just publish the true count of yes votes. So the true count it can be attacked. In our previous examples, senators can collude and use the true count to determine what other senators did. But in general, if you publish true counts, it makes you vulnerable to linking attacks and uh, data reconstruction attacks as well. So the final point is very important. The probability computation only involves randomness in the mechanism itself. We don't use any probabilities associated with the data. And there are several reasons for this. The first is it avoids problems like losing privacy guarantees by misspecifying the data distribution. And the second reason is that we can gain useful properties like composition, which is going to be discussed in a later talk. So let's see how this works in pictures. So here's one example of a pair of neighbors, D1 and D2. The only difference here is how Senator X uh, voted, either the blue vote or the green vote. So this pair of neighbors models the situation where the rest of the data has been collected and Senator X is mulling what response to give. So um, since D1 is a neighbor of D2 and D2 is also a neighbor of D1, we can plug them into the differential privacy equations, this one and this one. And together what they say is that Senator X's decision cannot change any output probability by a factor larger than E to the epsilon. So intuitively these equations guarantee that the noise we add almost masks out the contribution of Senator X. So remember, we have to consider all pairs of neighbors. Um, so the differential privacy equations are, are applied to neighbors that differ on Senator 1 to ensure that Senator 1 is protected. They differ on the neighbors for Senator 2 to make sure that uh, the, the differential privacy equations also apply to neighbors that differ for Senator 2 to ensure that Senator 2 is protected and so on. And if you actually counted uh, this set of neighbors, you'd see that there are 200, 2 to the 100 um, such possible neighbors. Okay? So, so that, that's why um, it's important to also know how to construct these algorithms, which will be covered in a later talk. Okay. But for now, we saw that differential privacy protects the response of any individual. Um, but what if we want to hide not just their response, but whether they participated in the survey in the first place? So, for example, if you're using IRS data for statistical purposes, you not only need to protect the contents of the tax returns you have access to, but you also need to protect information about whether someone or not even filed the tax form at all. So, similarly, um, if you run a STD study, uh, someone's participation in it could already be revealing, regardless of what information they provided. So, to hide participation and any response, if there is one, we can simply change the definition of neighbors. So instead of two databases being neighbors if they differ on the value of one record, we can say two databases are neighbors if you can obtain one from the other by adding or removing a record, like this. So this version of um, neighbors is called unbounded neighbors. Uh, and the reason is because it changes the size of the data set. Previous version was called bounded neighbors because it didn't change the size. Um, so here the difference between D1 and D2 is that D1 has an additional per person. And uh, based on the output of a differentially private mechanism, we won't be able to say with any confidence whether D1, whether the input was D1 or D2, which is the same, same as saying we don't know whether this person's data was used or not. 
So regardless of whether the person actually opts in or out, inference about whether their data was collected is protected and inference about the contents of the record is also protected. Okay, so far we talked about uh, bounded neighbors, which are pairs of databases that differ on the value of a record. Um, they, if you use that in the definition of differential privacy, it protects the contents of the record from inference. Then we talked about unbounded neighbors, which differ on the presence or absence of a record. If we use those with a different definition of differential privacy, we're protecting whether someone participated or not. And then there's a third commonly used um, definition of neighbors, and these are called action level neighbors. So the best way to introduce this concept is to have an example. So here's an example of two databases. Here, every customer has a record and every record consists of a set of actions, such as the purchases of a customer. So these databases, they differ on one purchase right here, um, one purchase uh, for one customer. And since we equate an action with a purchase, that means that these two databases differ on the action of one person. So if you use this definition of neighbors, what you're protecting is a specific action. So we don't know, we won't know if customer one bought a crab today. Uh, but what we're not protecting are inferences based on many actions about the customer. So for example, using action level, level neighbors, we can reveal that customer one likes seafood, but we won't know that they bought crab on a specific day. So in general, customers with many actions get weaker privacy protections than customers with fewer actions uh, in this setting. Okay, so to summarize, uh, you can choose how to define the concept of neighbors in the definition of differential privacy. So among the most popular choices, the first one we discussed is bounded neighbors, where two databases differ on the value of one record. And because all pairs of neighbors here have the same number of respondents, we can release n, the total number of respondents without noise. Okay, but what this means is that we should only use bounded neighbors if n, the number of respondents, is already public. We shouldn't voluntarily release this information. And the reason we don't want to release n in general is because we want to avoid data fragmentation. So here, here's an example. So we have a data collector with a large data set, but the data collector decides to split one big data set into many smaller data sets. So for example, for each combination of age, ethnicity, gender, disease, and geographic region, there is a new data set. Um, for example, there's one data set exclusively about 32-year-old Hispanic women with cancer in a small geographic region, and so on. So if you reveal the number of respondents in each of these tiny data sets, that degrades privacy significantly because, the detailed, because of the detailed selection criteria for these data sets. So as a general rule, it is good to avoid using bounded neighbors so that you don't leak and directly. Okay, then we talked about unbounded neighbors where uh, neighboring databases differ on the presence or absence of one individual's data. This means um, that neighboring databases here have different numbers of respondents, and so we cannot release the exact sample size n, but this is also the most recommended choice of neighbors. So finally, we discussed action level neighbors, which provide the weakest protections among the three. Okay, so to summarize the last 40 minutes, um, this is differential privacy, this is the definition. In a nutshell, it limits how much your information can change output probabilities. It protects uh, properties of the individual, but it allows you to infer properties of the population. So it resists linking attacks and other types of attacks. It's transparent, so you can release the source code. And privacy only depends on randomness in the mechanism, not in the data. So the main idea behind differential privacy is that we add just enough noise to hide the possible effect of any one individual. And there are two main models used today. One is the one where you trust the data collector, and one is the model where you don't, the local model.